Um, my name is Peter. Um, I am a senior lecturer at Cranfield University um, and most of my work is hydrogen based. However, um, last year I got an idea and um, this is the idea that I'm presenting. So first question is, how do these things work? This is like a lecture, so I'm expecting engagement. I know it's nine o'clock, we had a drink last night, but how does an N95 mask work? Okay, how? Okay, yep, that's part of it. What else? Is there anything else that happens? Yep, but how? More than that. So yeah, the fancy thing about N95 masks is that they um, have an electrostatic layer inside them. They use a, a very fine nozzle of polypropylene that's charged and then that lands on the surface, makes a fine mesh of electrostatically charged polypropylene. And that's how most of the um, uh, capture efficiency of an N95 mask um, works. And what we did is we said, okay, well, if you can catch aerosols using N95 mask and an electrostatic layer, maybe you could do the same kind of idea with um, aerosols out of an amine uh, scrubber. So um, the background to this is that lots and lots of things are going to install CCS in the future. It's likely to be amine scrubbing. And if you're going to install amine scrubbing, you're going to install it probably in a cluster location. And you can design a plant to meet emission limits for amine slip at the moment. However, when you start building lots and lots of plants in the same area in a cluster, you're likely to start having greater cumulative emissions of amines um, and the environmental impact of that area is gonna be worse. So the EA are likely to be stamping down in the future and say, you've got to meet structural limits. And if you've already designed and built your plant, you're not going to be able to retrofit very easily. So you need something that's going to be able to capture those amines with minimal pressure drop, minimal cost, all of that kind of stuff. So um, we looked or had the idea of electrostatic precipitation. Um, and there's lots of different ways of impacting aerosols and stopping them to getting out of the system. But these aerosols are tiny. They're like 0.1 micrometers to 10 or 50 micrometers. So they're really, really difficult to um, to uh, attract and to get rid of. Um, and you can't just have a, a mesh or you can't just have a, a filter because you're going to block up and you have pressure drop. And yeah, so the, there's not really many options. So you, you can use an activated bed, you can use a, a sorbent bed of some kind. Um, you can wash it with more water, but you're producing lots of wastewater. You can use an acid wash, um, but there's not really many better options. You can control temperature inside the amine um, adsorber. Um, but there's, again, not many options. So electrostatic pre precipitation is a potentially better option. So um, current emission limits for amines um, set last year, I believe, is actually only 100 micrometers per meter cubed for amines. And then the, the degradation <laughs> products are even stricter. Um, and the degradation products is, is even harder to, to capture. So... Um, what we have looked at is where, how do these emissions compare to um, existing uh, CCS plants around the world? So if you take a, a few data points, and these are only just a few data points, uh, Mongstad, they, they reported in their literature that they just couldn't meet their emission limits that they had to, that had to hit. Um, the plant in Norway that's been built at the moment, um, they, they can meet it, but they have a massively oversized double water wash. Um, and I think they've got an acid wash step as well. So they're producing loads and loads of wastewater with a very small concentration of amine that you have to treat and clean up and everything. Um, there, there must be a better option. So um, that's why we came up with the electrostatic precipitation option. Um, it's got minimal pressure drop, very high collection efficiency. Um, you don't really have that much of an energy demand because the amount of electron transfer is actually quite small. Um, and you don't have any extra resource. You don't have to replenish anything. You don't have to refill a pack bed or anything. Um, so um, it's a good idea. And yes, it's got some disadvantages, but it's probably one of the better options com compared to what we actually got available to us at the moment. So within this project that was funded by UKCCS um, and co-funded by Petrofac, um, we started looking at, um, okay, if you've got those amines and you've got essentially a, a molecule or an aerosol that's a has a dipole with itself. Um, we looked at if you have different types of um, amine molecules, then how do those dipoles change? How do the dipole change within the aerosol itself? Um, and what we found is that the essentially everything aligns, especially if you've got a 
an electric field which is acting within. So all of the dipoles within inside the aerosol will align together. And then if you have an electric field, then the dipole will rotate or the model aerosol will rotate in that electric field. Um, and then if you make the one side of that electrostatic precipitator smaller, then you can move the aerosol over to the other side because you'll collect a charge and that charge will move towards the, the more concentrated electric field. Um, so essentially, yes, it works. The idea it works. And we did a load of mathematics and it's fancy equations here, uh, pretty graphs. But yes, essentially, the idea works, um, but there's lots and lots of design refinement. It's the same problem Stuart had, and that there's too many parameters to actually refine, and you kind of need a way to optimize the number of parameters first and then do the actual optimization. Um, but yes, the, the idea works really well. We calculate a pressure drop through the system, and it's very small. Um, we know that the strength of the dipole um, determines how quickly you can capture these aerosols. So um, it also means that things that are not charged and not aerosols are not going to be affecting this um, electrostatic precipitator. Um, the, we've also considered re-evaporation of these amines once you've collected them, um, but shouldn't be an issue based on what we've found so far. Um, so the next steps of the project is to design and build some kind of a prototype. Um, and we also want to improve our modeling suite. So we, at the moment, we've got a modeling system that works. It was bashed together in a few hours. Thank you, CG. Um, but yeah, we, we've got to improve it. There's loads more we can do with that. So the next steps is to improve the modeling, build a system, actually demonstrate it in real life. So thank you very much. And thank you to CG for doing a lot of work. Uh, yeah, sorry if I, if I missed it, but um, what happens if you have uh... Amine vapor rather than amine aerosols. It won't be captured. It can be, but you have to make it really, really big. So it won't be captured. Um, so we have <clears> looked at um, how to increase the size of the aerosol droplets and to re droplets <laughs> coalesce the, the vapors into an, uh, an aerosol that could be collected. Okay. So, yeah. And in other aerosols, you're looking at seeded aerosols in the sense that, you know, as you probably know, um, Mongstadt got serious problems. Yep. I think they were the first place that reported it. Or, or are they sort of uh, unseeded? I mean, just just what happens if you if you get the right temperature after the absorber? Um, I don't know. <laughs> to be honest, we didn't go that far. They were, we, we used sort of, um, the modeling we did, we essentially said we've got a, a gas stream going in with um, 100 amine droplets of different types. And uh, yeah. That, that's that's as far as we got really i guess the reason i'm saying that is that if you if you get an aerosol on uh, a sulfuric acid mist say right. then it's reacted it's a yeah. you know it's, it's already gone it's not it's not a pure amine. it's an acid base reaction and that's certainly something that happens if you do have sulfuric acid yeah. mist going into the absorber yeah hi thank you uh christine on home for market carbon capture um, aerosols are pro produced or generated in the process uh, based on different process conditions. Uh, have you taken that into account? No, um, we've just said aerosols exist in the gas stream. No, but we, we recognize that if you controlled your um, absorber differently, then you would be able to reduce the amines that are going through. Um, we know that the temperature at which you operate and the amount of water washing you've got would depend on how many, um, what size and shape and type the aerosols are um, but no we didn't look into that in much detail okay thank you i believe our next speaker is professor young yan from the university of kent and um, is the head of the instrumentation and control research group or is yours uh, uh, good morning uh my area of uh, talk is uh oh, wait wait hmm. Yeah, my uh, talk is uh, very focused, as you can see from the title. This is uh, really uh, how do we uh, monitor what's going on in the CCI systems, including CO2 flow uh, in transportation pipelines. Also, sometimes it, it do we really know if any leaks uh, taking place uh, in the CCI pipes or even um, uh, and storage unit and so on. So uh, just mention briefly the challenges we, we are facing in trying to monitor CO2 flows, okay, through CCS chains. And CO2 uh, itself as a medium, that can be a gas, a liquid, a uh, gas liquid two-phase or supercritical forms. Uh, this all depends on temperature uh, and pressure ranges uh, at a particular point. 
So uh, uh, there are a lot of people working on this. They're trying to measure accurately flow rate of CO2. Uh, uh, this is uh, important not only for metrology uh, perspective. Uh, it, this kind of work also important for uh, regulations and for uh, policy makers. Okay, and, and that's that. Uh, technologies already exist, as, as such as the flow meters uh, based on uh, radiological, uh, for example, gamma rays, uh, uh, nuclear magnetic resonance uh, method, so uh, NMR. They are very expensive, so surely they are not suitable for wide uh, uh, usage uh, through CCS uh, systems. So uh, companies, including some university groups, they're working on uh, volumetric flow meters, which are well established. Okay, for example, ultrasonic. Okay, why did they use it in the uh, industry? But how good it is for a CO2 flow is not clear. <clears throat> and we have used Coriolis mass flow meters along with a few other groups uh, across the globe. Uh, very successful, but very for, good only for single phase, gas or, or liquid, but not for two phase flows. But they're not good for very large pipes. Okay, so it, it's difficult. Uh, when you capture CO2, you, you, never, you never know what happened to CO2 it, over like 500 kilometers transportation. Uh, and the leakage happened in the process. Okay, again, that's something we, 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 want, we want to do. So uh, to do this kind of research, you can't just go to a deployment uh, a site, just do it. Uh, we need to have a, some, somewhere safe and uh, repeatable. A, building, a test facility has been difficult. We tried very hard to build this. Uh, say to normally people think it's gas phase, but you make it liquid, you talk about high pressure. Okay, so this is the rig we, uh, we, we have designed and built uh, at 25 millimeter diameter, okay, uh, one inch internal diameter. Uh, you can have, you can see in the green part, this is in a liquid CO2 uh, from a storage uh, tank. Then we have a gas phase, and we mix them up and, and up two phase. So the measurement of liquid, less a problem. Maximum gas uh, phase, not a problem. It's one that become gas liquid two phase mixture. Uh, it's hugely difficult. If you look at the people who want the measurement, they only can mass, total mass, or mass flow rate uh, over a period of time. They don't care about the shape of flow regime. But this two phase mixture makes a measurement extremely difficult. Okay. And we, uh, we're making a system working, also we can inject impurity gases. Okay. And uh, this is often happened. So you to, you say CO2, not always CO2, there's some, some shares in it, so, so that's that. So we have uh, managed to uh, uh, build this uh, quite a unique facility. Uh, it's a complex uh, system. Uh, that we have a reference site, you can see in the uh, column, we have a, a weight which could give us a very reliable reference uh, for a mass flow measurement. So the weight method gives us a lot more reliable uh, reference. We, we also have a mass meter method. So this gave us some idea what's really happening uh, uh, in, in a CCS system. So we have uh, some reference. We also use the same site to do leakage uh, detection as well. So this gave you some idea when, um, when we fix roughly the same uh, volume of gas uh, in, in the pipe, but we increase uh, CO2 uh, flow rate. You can see the uh, highly stratified, uh, partially stratified, or quite fully turbulent flows. The CO2 flows, that will happen in capture CO2 pipes. Okay. So this gives you some idea what we expect in the flow, but we are not interested to identify what they are. We want to measure total mass and flow rate so we can do metrology. So this is critical, but that, this kind of two-phase mixture makes um, flow monitoring very difficult. Okay, now how do we do it? We try to uh, use uh, established uh, technology called Coriolis flow meters. Okay, uh, this kind of technology we establish, but only for single phase, single phase gas a liquid. You know, we don't know very much about the meter performance uh, for CO2 flow, even gas or a liquid. For gas liquid two phase, even more difficult. We've done a lot of work on this. The idea is very simple. We use the Coriolis flow meter, which give us a mass flow rate, which is wrong under two phase conditions. Give us a density, which is also wrong uh, under two phase conditions. We have temperature from the flow meter device. Uh, we, we install a different suppressor transducer, okay, along with a Coriolis flow meter. So we develop uh, uh, data driven models, kind of a machine learning method. Uh, uh, we build that model and also we can do inside uh, institute training if you have a reference uh, that is uh, reliable. Okay, so the idea is very simple we want total mass 
mass flow rate. Also, you, you can work, work out how much bubble, say to bubble in that, even the quantity of impurities. So this is some uh, just uh, image you can see uh, on the rig, we can see the whole uh, chaotic flow media. Uh, on the test, uh, you can see some reference uh, 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 setups. A, a quick slide to show you uh, how good uh, uh, the machine learning model. Uh, chaotic flow media gave us reading, they are completely wrong. You can see on the left hand side, the, the errors go all over the place. Okay, plus minus two percent. Uh, uh, gone through uh, the data driven models, we can we can reduce the error down to plus minus one point five percent. Okay, this is a huge uh, success in terms of a measurement. We are not increasing any meter cost here. No extra hardware involved. Okay, simple do a simple model, we can achieve quite good good uh, uh, measurement. So uh, we, we have tried to study how do we uh, monitor CO2 flow under dynamic flow conditions. So why is it dynamic? Uh, simply because uh, uh, we can't assume a CO2 flow in a pipeline is constant. Okay, and because the CCI system often uh, operated flexibly, depending on the power load, depends on how the plant is operated. Sometimes the rapid start, stop, and, and the different power load, hence flow rate is different. So uh, flow is uh, quite dynamic in the pipelines. So that makes uh, uh, the flow measurement more difficult. Okay, we want total mass. We don't care about the dynamic or transcend properties, but we don't know very much about transcend behaviors of uh, CO2, especially two-phase CO2. So we have a big system, you can see here. Uh, we, we have an imaging system, we have all these uh, pressure transducers. We have developed capacitance CO2 uh, flow sensors. You can see quite a steady device because of high pressure involved. Mm -hmm. So if you can project them, uh, if you click. Now, this is the uh, one we uh, start up uh, CO2 process. What is in this is a gas phase CO2. Then liquid CO2 comes in. Okay, this is really a, a transient process. We want to monitor total mass of CO2, regardless of gas or liquid. Okay, that's all the target where we are doing. And uh, it is, the results we have got is pretty encouraging. Okay, even it's very difficult for like this, it's worked pretty well. And we have observed uh, what happened if uh, you start up a CCS process. So you can see step change. We can monitor the mass flow rate change, also density change. Okay, just observe what ha really happened uh, in a CO2 process. Did uh, CO2 gas change liquid and vice versa, uh, and how? So uh, we also created a different uh, dynamic condition, such as we can uh, stop a pump, uh, open and release valve. We can look at how mass flow change, how density change with time along with the pressure change and the temperature change. So a lot of such operation processes so we understand fluid conditions much better. Okay, liquid gas, uh, liquid, uh, gas, gas CO2 are also two-phase conditions. Okay, we also, uh, on the same rig, we did a lot of uh, leakage detection. We create such uh, conditions here. Uh, we know the reference, so we know the how much uh, CO2 leak. Just look at temperature and acoustic emission sensors. Just use sensors to listen to what's happening to the system. Uh, the cheap, uh, widely accessible, and the very, uh, uh, this is giving a power spectrum seeing the signature of the uh, leakage. It's very interesting, we can predict leakage rate from the system. Also even predict uh, how much uh, impurities uh, from, from, uh, in the system come out from the leakage point. So just a quick summary. So, um, so far uh, we have uh, used Coriolis flow meters to monitor uh, uh, gas CO2, liquid CO2, or gas liquid CO2. If single phase, pretty accurate, no trouble, whatever, to meet this standard. But if two phase is plus minus 1.5%, we are trying to reduce this error further. So the data driven modeling tank is, is worked very well, particularly for fluid measurement. We are working on, uh, more on this to make sure leakage also worked uh, as good. So we are reporting this now, but we are still, uh, still a lot of work to be done. Uh, in the near future. Okay, so finally, I'd like to thank UKCCRC for supporting my work. Thank you. I have a question. So the Coriolis flow meter is a single phase meter. So if we use the single phase meter to measure the multi-phase flow, like a gas, gas liquid two-phase flow, mm -hmm. well, what will happen? It will overread or underestimate the flow rate? Uh, a good question, if I show you that image, yeah, uh, this image is here. If it's a uh, uh, cross flow meter, uh, it's two phase mixture, you can see sometimes overrate, sometimes mm -hmm. uh, underrate. Depends on the, how much gas in that. 
Okay. Also depends on pressure, temperature, and, and flow rate. So okay. it's uh, quite a few factors. So mm -hmm. we, we can't tell. So, but uh, from metrology's perspective, people pay their bills. Total mass is important. <laughs> Uh, it, it, how much gas is that not important, but this two phase mixture makes, makes measurement difficult. Okay. So uh, that's the image that reached that standard plus minus 1.5%. Okay, so, that's quite good. Thank you. You mentioned at the beginning of the presentation ultrasonic meters as well. Are you, is your work just on Coriolis type? Uh, uh, yeah, well, my, uh, my group's work focused on Coriolis flow meters uh, plus uh, machine learning models. Uh, ultrasonic the flow meter, I have a colleague uh, okay. who is working on this. Uh, ultrasonic one, uh, you probably know this is very much, you can measure volume, flow rate, yeah. but you have to measure density That's and right. compare them. Yeah. Uh, and ultrasonic is good for large diameter, not for small, small diameter. So uh, I, I'm aware there are a few companies working on this, but we have a contact in uh, each area. Richard Porter, University College London. Uh, do you think, uh, Young, that uh, impurities in the CO2 stream can cause a significant error in CO2 flow measurement? And if so, how would you overcome that? Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, very, very good uh, question. Yeah, we are aware of these uh, challenges. The presence of a uh, uh, minute amount of uh, impurity can affect uh, uh, gas uh, liquid phase uh, uh, patterns, uh, uh, also the measurement. So uh, we only make the rig uh, working by inject nitrogen so far. We can also uh, inject other uh, impurity as well. And then we have observed this small uh, amount of nitrogen affect flow patterns uh, and measurement, but we haven't quantified yet. We're still doing more work on that. So, so uh, uh, it's something very difficult. Uh, people working in CSS know this issue, but we want to study more to quantify so to, so to be reported in, in the near future. Uh, our next speaker uh, is Enny Oko um, from Newcastle, who is a senior lecturer in chemical engineering. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is uh, Enny Oko, um, and I'm from uh, Newcastle University. And today I wanted to talk to you about our um, flexible funded research project. Our project is um, looking at catalyzed regeneration. Um, we all know that the key challenges with um, the key challenges with uh, solvent regeneration in this process is that it's energy intensive, and um, the energy the energy intensity could be as high as four gigajoule, you know, per ton of CO two capture. Um, looking at MEA, for instance, so um, there are lots of research activities. Um, some of them focusing on developing entirely new solvents. Um, and all that is for the purposes of reducing the um, solvent regeneration energy in this process. The other point is that um, the solvent regeneration energy constitutes uh, a big part of the energy requirement in this process, including the OPEX uh, requirements in this process. So our approach to addressing this uh, problem is looking at um, catalyzing the regeneration phase of uh, part of this process. Considering what has been done in literature regarding cat catalyst-aided regeneration, um, we can see from this uh, data published in literature that there is uh, quite a lot of different catalysts on the horizontal axis. Uh, that has been investigated for different uh, blends of solvents. What is uh, very consistent for each of the solvents and each of the catalysts tested is that it's possible to achieve reduced regeneration energy um, when you have a, a catalyst support. If you look at some of the solvent classes, you will find that you can, um, that for instance, looking at um, this solvent class and this solvent class, uh, the blank solvent uh, with some um, zeolite catalyst that you can actually achieve 20% difference in terms of uh, the regeneration energy requirement. The other point is that with uh, catalyst support that we can also significantly increase 
the amount of CO2 that can be dissolved during regeneration. The, the benefit of this will be that you, you require a significantly reduced amount of solvent you know, in the process. When this happens, the, there are different things. Uh, one of them that one of the potential advantages when this happens could be that your absorber and desorber sizes will be significantly reduced. And looking at this also and understanding the, the, um, the, the contribution of water to the, um, to the desorption energy, this kind of makes more sense of the previous results, um, highlighting strongly you know, the prospects of achieving um, reduced uh, energy use. Um, our approach to our, um, some of the key challenges, these are some of the things that has not been captured in my slide, sorry. Um, uh, maybe after now, I will still upload my most updated slide. But one of the key things that we are looking at is that just a few so, um, catalysts has been tested. What, uh, the things that are clear to us from, from literature is that there is a strong um, correlation between the catalyst type and the solvent type. And with the benefits that have been demonstrated with a few so, uh, solvents and catalysts that have been tested in the lab, the, we have the understanding that um, it is potentially possible to achieve even increased reduction in the renewable, uh, sorry, in the uh, regeneration energy. On that basis, then, what we want to do is to develop um, a computational approach, um, develop a computational approach that can be used to determine the, um, that can be used to determine the combination of catalyst and solvent that will give you the best performance in terms of increased, uh, uh, reduced regeneration energy requirement. This, um, the, the approach that we have proposed uses a computational chemistry software uh, that is called ADF. And what we, what we, how it works in theory is that we theoretically build these molecules in, in, in this software and um, <coughs> with, with Having produced that, we can um, predict the transition state for the particular combination. So if we have MEA, um, MEA solvent, loaded MEA solvent, um, alongside, um, say, um, zeolite software, uh, sorry, zeolite catalyst, which is the most widely used in literature, partly because um, it's a very much established uh, catalyst in the industry. So, Looking at this particular combination, the approach will then be able to predict for us the transition state um, for, the part, for, the, for the reaction required. And with the transition state information, we can determine so many things. One of them being, one of the things that we will determine being the, uh, the, uh, the activation energy, which kind of represents the energy barrier for the system. And um, from the comparisons that we have done, the the combination that gives you um, lower activation energy will also tend to uh, match with what's been published in literature as having uh, um, reduced um, regeneration energy. So on, uh, we can, having established that, I'll show you a few results uh, shortly. We can then use this principle to actually um, computationally determine what catalyst is, is good for what solvent. And this, uh, the other thing that we can also predict with this <coughs> model is that with the information we have from this model, we can also um, predict the potential kinetics for, for the particular catalyst. With that information, we are now able to um, create more accurate models for the system. Um, this is important for so many reasons. One of them being the, um, the main challenge of trying to do, do this sort of test in the lab. With our approach, we can significantly cut down on the um, amount of time that we require to test um, very many combinations um, in the lab. 
The other um, advantage is that because we are able to relatively, to a good extent, predict the reaction kinetics, um, we are also able to fill an important gap that is currently uh, in literature, which is that uh, for most of these cases, while the concept has been largely proven, the um, kinetics for various catalysts versus different uh, solvents are not available in literature. And for process engineers that will be seeking to, oh, all right. So this is an example of um, what we've tried to do um, involving zeolite catalysts and the uh, MEA and the uh, CO2. And um, this is the transition states that we've um, managed to establish from that. We have done this for several um, catalysts. And um, sorry, the, this, the, the part of the result is, is where it's missing. And I'm going to pass the slide to um, the, the staff and uh, anybody that have interest to see uh, some of the results that we've been able to produce from our work. You know, can have a look, and uh, if you have more interest, uh, feel free to get in touch. Um, just in addition, we have also produced um, a model of this process using some of the of the kinetic information that we have gotten. We have also produced um, a model for this and uh, done a bit of validation using some data we got from um, our partner from Can Canada, um, uh, with very uh, interesting agreements with uh, with the data. So. Sorry about that. If you have more interest in knowing a bit more about this, I'm going to be hanging by the side and uh, be happy to talk you through it. Um, just to thank UKCCS to, for supporting my project and of course my students and the UNIPI especially uh, because they were very supportive through this project. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for your nice presentation. Uh, I have some questions. Did you perform any cost analysis about the catalyst? Because you know, you are decreasing the energy requirement for regeneration, yeah. but in addition, you have to buy catalyst or produce catalyst. Okay, um, we've not done any, um, we've not done um, costing for the catalyst. Uh, but one thing is key though, uh, for, for the established catalyst, because we, we've, we've, uh, we've done two things, which is first of all to, try to retreat what has been done, um, most of the catalysts that have been reported in literature, and then to also look at building completely new um, catalyst molecules for our own application. For the established catalysts like zeolites, these are pretty very cheap um, catalysts. I think the key question which has to be addressed from an experiment will have to be like the life cycle for for this catalyst before they will be required to be changed. Um, yeah, I wanted that, to ask, this, this was my question next. Uh, I wanted to ask you how many times it takes you have to change the catalyst, regenerate the catalyst, and uh, how much amount of catalyst you have to use in a, in a packed bed column, for example. Yeah, um, in standard applications from reported data in, in a, from experiments, if um, you have some case of around for very uh, trivial um, sizes, anyways. They've used as little as, um, I think, two point something gram per ton of CO2 if you scale it. So it's actually very little amount of catalyst. The other thing is that there are um, also some experiments where they have done as much as 50 cycles before they require to completely uh, change the catalyst. Hi, um, yeah, thank you. It's an interesting talk. Um, so if I understood correctly, you're, you're planning on effectively spraying the, the catalyst on the, the packing in the, in the desorber. Is, there, is, there, uh, is anyone looking at putting the catalyst into the, the reboiler where the, the regeneration actually takes place? Or is it, is it something that you could do in addition to? Yes, that is uh, what I think. Um, the other question that we are also looking at, most, uh, most of our work has focused on the, on the computational chemistry bit, but the other aspect of the work we are looking at from the process engineering uh, point of view is looking at how the regenerator is going to be designed in the, in the, in the, in the first instance. But yes, it's, it's going to be possible that the catalyst is going to sit in the reboiler or within the packing in the column. When, when you say the, the energy for regeneration changes, what, what changes in the inputs and outputs to the, uh, 
to the stripper because there must be some change for the energy to be different. Now, if you've got the same the same solvent and gas flows, obviously the energy will be the same. But so, what's different? Yeah. So, um, thank you, Adam. Um, so, when we say changes, it's actually looking at the um, the case with catalyst and the case with no catalyst. So, looking at, um, for instance, NEA, where you have, for instance, uh, around four point two gigajoules per pump as the standard regeneration energy, and we are then looking at the equivalent. Um, the, the equivalent of the regeneration energy for the case with catalyst. Yeah, I understand that, but what's changed? Because the energy has changed, but some of the inputs and outputs must have changed as well. The, you know, the lean loadings changed, or the the, the yeah, CO so, the CO two so, to steam ratio at the tops changed. What's changed? Yeah. So um, from from the modeling point of view, what we do is that we try <coughs> to keep our our resolvent coming into the into the stripper fix. And yes, we achieve lower lean, lean, lean loading compared to the uh, compared to the case without catalyst. I think that's the point I was making when I was talking about increased desorption rate uh, with catalyst. Yeah. So yes, the lean loading changes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Speaker got his master's at Imperial uh, and is now doing a PhD here at Sheffield. So, uh, so my uh, my talk is on the uh, the use of uh, copper carbonate as a corrosion inhibitor in uh, post combustion carbon capture. Now, uh, as we've already heard, and I'm sure you all know, uh, uh, amine scrubbing is one of the most uh, promising and well developed techniques for post combustion carbon capture. However, uh, there are uh, high temperatures and, of course, the presence of CO2 that uh, create a highly corrosive environment. Uh, and so that's why uh, most, more often uh, than not, stainless steel is uh, being recommended uh, for use as an infrastructure material in those processes. However, stainless steel is not impervious to localized effects and also uh, it has a high cost. So uh, what, what we need to do is we need to have a, a mitigation uh, strategy so that we can use carbon steel in as much in as many parts of this process as we can, and specifically the, uh, the absorber, which operates at around uh, between 40 and 80 degrees uh, C. So first, we need to uh, establish where the corrosivity of CO2 loaded amines comes from. Uh, we know that amines are not inherently corrosive, but we, we know that when they react with CO2, uh, what is being produced is a series of uh, highly corrosive ions, such as the carbonate ion, the carbonate, and the bicarbonate ion. Uh, in this slide, I, I've also included the, uh, the uptake mechanism for uh, primary amines. One such amine is monoethanolamine, which is when, when we will be focusing on is the benchmark for most of the, uh, the pilot plants. So to start the carbon steel corrosion in CO2 loaded uh, MEA, we're using immersion uh, experiments. So in these experiments, uh, we immerse a carbon steel coupon in a five molar MEA solution at 60 degrees uh, uh, for up to 10 weeks in duration while continuously purging with CO2 to basically simulate corrosion, uh, the, uh, the, the process conditions. And uh, at the end, we est estimate the uh, corrosion rate by calculating the, the net mass loss from the coupon. And we can also track the uh, dissolved ions in solution uh, via ICP. So as you can see, uh, the net mass loss increases with uh, with increasing duration, and this can be a, a bit misleading because it suggests that uh, this reaction uh, happens sort of nicely and steadily, which is never the case. Um, so if you actually look at this slide, which is the iron concentration in solution, you can see that there's a range of behaviors that is being exhi exhibited that we cannot study with just immersion uh, experiments alone. So we need to introduce more characterization techniques. So um, in the SCM images, you see that the untreated surface is relatively smooth. Um, and also the XRD pattern uh, just shows basically just the ferrite uh, peaks as we would expect. As we increase the duration of immersion to one week, we see that there is relatively no change. The, the surface is slightly rougher, but there is no corrosion product on it. Uh, the, the XRD pattern remains the same. Between one and five weeks, however, we see the formation of, uh, of a corrosion product, and XRD identifies the product as uh, cementite, which is iron carbide. Uh, 
And the, the precipitation of cement that also explains the graph we saw earlier, because essentially between one and five weeks here, uh, the decrease in iron concentration in solution basically is explained because the iron ions are leaving the solution to be uh, deposited on, on the surface. However, this uh, behavior is not continuous because after between one, uh, five and 10 weeks, what we see is um, uh, a, an increase in iron concentration in solution. And, and at the same time, the, the surface ends up being covered by a relatively amorphous uh, corrosion product. So now that we've established how corrosion uh, progresses in carbon steels, we can discuss mitigation techniques. Now, there are many techniques. Um, what we will be focusing on is corrosion inhibitors uh, because they don't require any modifications to the process. No extra steps are needed, and that's a huge advantage. Um, the, mostly, uh, corrosion inhibitors are uh, basically categorized by which uh, reaction they suppress, and we'll be mostly talking about anodic uh, inhibitors. The, 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 the best results so far have been exhibited by uh, inhibitors, including arsenic and vanadium, which is both of them are highly toxic. So we need to find alternatives. And one such is uh, copper carbonate, which has been suggested in the literature. So to test the inhibition efficiency of copper carbonate, we uh, repeated the immersion experiments from earlier uh, for a slightly longer duration. Uh, and we introduced different loadings for uh, copper carbonates, as you can see here. At the end, we calculated the inhibition efficiency. Uh, the inhibition efficiency were, was, well, the, the, the inhibitor basically was, was uh, very efficient. And in all cases, the, the efficiency was above 99.9%. Uh, and even in the lowest uh, loading of inhibitor, 0.9 millimolar, there, was no, there were no traces of ICP, of iron in the ICP. So, uh, we know that we have a, uh, an inhibitor that works. We just need to figure out how it works. Uh, we, there's no clear evidence of copper being absor absorbed on the surface or a protective film being formed, which, which are the, the, the most common uh, inhib inhibition mechanisms. So our running hypothesis is that copper and amine form a complex uh, in solution. And so inhibition rather happens in solution rather than on the surface. So to study the, uh, the speciation and, the, and the, the solution chemistry, we're employing X-ray absorption spectroscopy measurements that were done at the synchrotron in here in Diamond and in Italy in Trieste at Eletra. So uh, essentially, we are collecting for the corrosion tests, the initial ones with iron and MEA. We are collecting uh, the uh, iron K edge uh, Zane spectra, and for the inhibition tests that uh, include copper carbonate, we are using we are collecting the copper K edge uh, spectra, and we are comparing. In both cases, we use the flow cell so that we can heat up from room temperature all the way up to 80. And uh, also both solutions, we collected spectra at room temperature, 40 degrees, and then 80 degrees. So as you can see from the, uh, from the normalized spectra, uh, the edge peaks correspond to iron ox oxide and copper oxide for the corrosion test and the, the inhibition test respectively. So in other words, the speciation is identified as iron 2 plus and copper 2 plus in, in the two solutions. The pre-edge peaks, however, indicate that in the case of iron, we have the formation of a square pyramidal iron 3 plus complex, so slightly different speciation. And in the case of copper, we have uh, a square planar copper 2 plus complex. So to verify the complex formation a little bit further, what we're doing is that we're comparing this, the, the, the spectra we, we gathered uh, with common inorganic species that we would expect to find in those systems. Uh, in the case of iron, uh, none of the corrosion products was, was present. And we also use linear combination fitting to exclude the, the, the chance of a physical mixture of those products to be present. Um, so we, we're still, we have a suggestion that iron 2 plus or a mixture of iron 2 plus and iron 3 plus are in solution. So we can tentatively propose that uh, uh, a complex is being formed with amine and an amine with an amine ligand. However, most more work needs to be done here. Uh, with respect to the inhibition tests, all three uh, in all three temperatures, you can see that the uh, the, the, the standard that fits the, the best is copper carbonate, basically dissolved in five molar isobutyl amine. Uh, isobutylamine is a, is a monodentate ligand, and so uh, basically what we can suggest is that copper is complexing with MEA because MEA is also a monodentate uh, ligand and is forming a bidentate structure like the one you see here. So, summarize, uh, we've established that 
CO2 loaded amines are corrosive and the need for a mitigation strategy for carbon steel corrosion uh, to be sort of suppressed. Um, copper carbonate has been proven to be a, a, a viable option and the zanes uh, and, the, and zanes has been used to characterize the, uh, the, the speciation. Um, we, we, uh, we can propose that uh, copper carbonate is forming uh, a complex with MEA. Uh, copper is forming a, a complex with MEA and the structure is a bidentate structure. So in the future, we want to use also uh, electrochemistry to figure out how the mechanism uh, of inhibition works and more in situ XA asynchrotron uh, data should be gathered to sort of find out more about complexation. And further down the line, we'd like to develop a new inhibitor uh, and incorporate copper carbonate in ionic liquid and see what happens there. Uh, thank you to everyone who, of course, participated uh, and to you for your attention. Thank you. Have you measured what the copper does to the amine itself after this program? Yeah, that's, that's basically one of the next steps also to see what it does to the uptake mechanism because we need to make sure that we're not, we're not somehow losing what it does, basically, what yeah. we want it to do. Yeah. Well, if you, because you're already saying you've potentially got two amines together, that sounds like it's halfway to making DEA and the nitrosamine precursor. Oh, I see what you mean. Okay, yeah, that's an interesting, yeah. Okay, we'll take that into account. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good, uh, yeah. thank you. I, I had a question about, um, the carbon steel, I've got absolutely no idea myself, so you can just tell me I'm wrong. But um, would you build an amine absorber with carbon steel or would you go for a better alloy that's unlikely to degrade anyway? So the idea is, yeah, so most of the alternatives are just much more uh, expensive. That's, yeah. the, that's the issue. So yeah, we're, using, we're trying to mitigate so that we can use carbon steel in as much in as many devices, uh, uh, use it as an infrastructure material and as many uh, sort of pipes and uh, Thanks and comms as we can. Yeah. No, it's, it's just about, because uh, again, I'm not 100% sure either, but how would you envision this actually being installed on the equipment? Is it a coating or is it welded on as an anode? So the, or is it... the, so the idea, okay, I didn't probably didn't describe that very well. So the thing is, this is this is being used as an infrastructure material. So this is what the absorber is made out of. Okay. Essentially, the issue is that if you use a relatively cheaper material, and that happens in, in, in uh, plants all over the world, they're literally dissolving from the inside out. So what we're trying to do is find mitigation techniques, either through coatings, mm -hmm. which is another mitigation strategy, or by using inhibitors to, to either form, sort of be absorbed on the surface, of the, on the inner walls of a pipe or a, or a, a reactor or the, the absorber. So would that be done before installation or is it done as part of operation? Like does it, because my, uh, my understanding of anodes is it's just welded onto the side of a plate. Before, and... okay, yeah. So the thing is, um, th there are some cases where it's used and while it's operating, it's forming a layer. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are other cases where it's done prior. Okay. Yeah. Good, fair enough. Thank you. Our final speaker for this session is Dr. Richard Porter, uh, who comes from UCL. He's a senior research associate there, but he actually originally came from the University of Leeds, where he did his PhD two years before me. I think. Thank you. Okay. So, so the title of our flexible funded project was optimizing methanol production from steel manufacture of gases. And the work I present today, uh, the co authors are Paul Cobden from Swery Maybe, which is a, a metals research institute in Northern Sweden, and Haroon Margrefde, who was the PI of the project. So I'll start off with some uh, facts and figures about the iron and steel and methanol. So the iron and steel industry is the largest energy consuming manufacturing sector in the world. And the average specific emissions are 1.83 tons of CO2 per ton of steel in 2018. Uh, 1.8 gigatons of steel were produced, and uh, that was up by 4.6% from 2017. So CCUS can uh, offer the opportunity to reduce the CO2 footprint of steel mills, and these account for between 5 and 7% of the anthropogenic uh, CO2 emissions. In 2016, methanol production was 85 million tonnes, and this is made mainly from fossil fuel sources, uh, mainly from natural gas, but in China, up to 67% from coal. And the demand for methanol is expected to increase as the world tries to shift away from fossil fuel uh, consumption. 
So there's currently great interest in uh, valorizing the byproduct uh, steel gases to make uh, you know, uh, chemicals for everyday use. And this should be done in a uh, Paris Agreement com uh, compatible way. Uh, the, the current use of uh, uh, steel off gases is to generate uh, heat and power. So this would be an alternative to this. So with all this in mind, we undertook a study which was the process simulation and techno-economic analysis of methanol synthesis from blast finished gas in an integrated steelworks CCS system. So the properties of blast furnace gas, it contains uh, some uh, CO, uh, carbon monoxide, it contains uh, some CO2, and it contains a small amount of hydrogen and a large amount of uh, uh, nitrogen. It's dubbed a uh, ultra low uh, calorific uh, gas. And this means it has an extremely high um, carbon intensity when you use it as a fuel. And the basis of calculation for our simulation was a 340 tonnes of blast furnace gas being available uh, for CCUS. And this was on the advice of our industrial partners. And this is equivalent to the amount that would ordinarily be uh, sent to the power plant. So con uh, conventional methanol is produced by steam reforming. Uh, to produce a syngas, which is compressed and sent to a methanol synthesis system, uh, followed by dist uh, distillation. And the process route that we decided to go for was based on direct uh, CO2 uh, hydrogenation. And this involves uh, cleaning the blast furnace gas first, uh, doing a water gas shift, uh, separating the shifted uh, blast furnace gas into nitrogen, uh, CO2 and uh, hydrogen. Uh, some of the CO2 can go for storage, while the remainder gets compressed and also uh, sent to methanol synthesis uh, based on a slightly different reaction scheme and then followed by uh, methanol distillation. So some of the advantages of taking the direct CO2 hydrogenation um, uh, blast finished gas to, to methanol route are that it avoid, avoids the very difficult uh, nitrogen and carbon monoxide separation, which is a known bottleneck for uh, gas processing. And the synthesis reaction impurities are limited to water and dissolved CO2 in the crude methanol. And this allows for a single uh, methanol distillation unit. There's a less intense exotherm compared to uh, the syngas reaction, and that allows for a tube cooled reactor with lower cost, higher efficiency, uh, relative simplicity of operation, and it avoids the use of multiple reactors in series, which may be required with adiabatic operation. It also improves the heat distribution in the reactor, which prevents uh, catalyst sintering. There are some disadvantages because you can't cheat thermodynamics. So some heat will be lost in the uh, water gas shift process, and the CO2 syngas is uh, less reactive than the CO2 CO syngas which leads to a larger reactor and more water is produced due to the reaction uh, stoichiometry. So this is the uh, process that we came up with. It's uh, very similar to a, a pre-combustion type process to process blast furnace gas with a high and low temperature uh, water gas shift reactions. <coughs> when the water is removed and the uh, uh, shifted, sing uh, shifted blast furnace gas is dry, and we separate the nitrogen, CO2, and hydrogen using a vacuum uh, pressure swing absorption uh, system. Uh, part of the CO2 then goes to uh, CO2 transport and storage, while the remainder gets sent to a uh, methanol synthesis loop. Um, in the methanol synthesis loop, there's a uh, methanol reactor and an incomplete conversion in the methanol reactor. So, what happens there is you, is you cool down the methanol and syngas mixture uh, to separate the crude methanol and part of, the, uh, part of the gas gets recycled. Part of it gets purged to avoid the accumulation of inerts in the process. And this purge stream can be sent back to the uh, entry of the 
a low temperature water gas shift reactor to improve the conversion. Uh, the process also uh, uh, produces a nitrogen st stream, and that can be used further on the steel pump, uh, potentially, and part of this stream gets used uh, as a sparging gas to, uh, to uh, improve the product quality. And so we translated that process into an Aspen uh, flow sheet and all the different parts of the process I was talking about, that you can see are uh, marked up here. So in the overall mass balance, uh, well, coming from the vacuum pressure swing uh, adsorption system, get 96% purity uh, CO2 and 85% overall CO2 capture um, from the blast furnace gas. And uh, about 75% of the post shift CO2 goes for CO2 storage, while the rest goes for uh, methanol uh, synthesis. And then you can produce about 99 0.9% uh, purity uh, industrial get grade methanol uh, and around 200,000 tonnes per year. So that's slightly larger than the UK's current uh, consumption. Uh, for the overall energy balance, uh, the, the largest energy consuming part of the plants are the compressors and the vacuum pumps. But uh, a fair portion of this energy can be rec recovered from cooling operations and also the energy that comes from the exothermic uh, reactions. So we undertook a techno-economic analysis and we have a, uh, a list of costs and values of streams, materials and utilities. Now what's maybe slightly different about this is that we took a blast furnace gas price, which is about three to four times lower than the pre-pandemic uh, thermal equivalent of the natural gas price. And also we can consider that steam to be fed to the system could be generated from uh, waste heat from the core industrial uh, steelworks uh, process. So without going into all the data details and uh, equations, we were able to uh, calculate the capital cost of the plant, it came to around 125 million pounds. And we also uh, calculate the fixed and variable uh, operating and maintenance costs. And this uh, led us to some key performance indicators where we compared a CCU case and a CCUS case to a business as usual uh, steel plant. So the only difference between the CCU case and the CCUS case is that we don't apply the CO2 uh, transport and storage cost and those that that co2 is not considered avoided uh, so in the ccu case we get quite a, a modest uh, reduction in the co2 intensity of steel but the levelized cost of methanol production is slightly lower than the um, selling price of methanol so this implies that this process could be profitable although it's not anymore when you add the storage cost, but then you do improve the uh, CO2 emission reduction potential to about uh, reducing about 40% of the steel plant's uh, CO2 emissions. And the cost of CO2 avoided is uh, still quite small at uh, eight pounds per tonne. Uh, so to summarize then, uh, I think CCS processes will uh, play an important role in CO2 mitigation by capturing the emitted CO2 and using it to make uh, chemical products that would otherwise be made from fossil fuels. And we've presented some analysis here to consider a CCS technology for the iron and steel industry, uh, which is based on direct hydrogenation of CO2. We undertook a full scale conceptual design in Aspen Plus to calculate the mass and energy balances and about evaluate the techn technological, economic, and environmental uh, criteria. So the sector economic analysis has shown favorable scenarios for producing methanol from blast furnace gas, but this, these may be subject to the intrinsic uh, blast furnace gas price. And then just one more 
outcome that we had from the uh, flexible funding is that we got a lot much larger project funded from the uh, European uh, Union, and that's called C4U, Advanced Carbon Capture for Steel Industries, integrated in CCUS clusters, and you can read about it on the website. I'll leave it there. Thanks. Hi. Um, the capital costs, how did you generate them, or what methodology did you use? So we, some, some of the, the equipment we got the prices from Aspen Plus Economic Analyzer, and others we derive from literature and looked at how much vessels cost to DOE type okay. uh, uh, correlations, mm -hmm. vessel sizes, and lots of different vertical or horizontal. Okay, so cool. And it's a it's an equipment cost, and then you add on insulation factors and stuff like that. Yes, yeah. So we get, uh, the, the, the charges, the, the initial charges, the catalysts to the solvent, and some of those are to install cool okay great cheers um so i kind of have two questions one's very quick though uh first one is um what was the percentage efficiency of nitrogen separation uh, yeah i can't remember it off the top of my head it looked Sorry. crazy high <laughs> because you had like times 10 to the minus three in your product stream of nitrogen i was also wondering if you're having if nitrogen is going to be in the feedstock are there going to be like side reactions with inside the methanol synthesis that would then there, there is nitrogen in the feedstock so at the entry it would be something like one to something like five or up to maybe i think it was up to 12 percent if we had a really yeah. high rate of recycle of the purge methanol synthesis loop yeah um, but it didn't really slow down the uh i was just wondering uh, if you get like cyanide forming or like yeah or possibly something. but we didn't include that in the reaction mechanism. okay yeah. cool hi thank you very much uh, um the difference between the ccu and the ccus case uh was quite large it was around 100 uh was it euros per ton um I was wondering what's the difference because typically one would think that the CCU case, even if you have a commodity that you can sell, uh, you also have an additional capex cost. So you would think that that would be uh, actually more expensive than the CCU, CCS case. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah, so the, the CCUS case is the same as the CCU case, but it just adds on a charge for uh, compression, transport, and storage. But you you then uh, use all the CO2, I mean, you store all the CO2 instead of making methanol. No, you, 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 do make, both. you make methanol and you right, store right, the, okay. the CO2, whereas in the CCU case, that CO2 stream would, say, get mixed with stack gases and emitted to the atmosphere. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks. It's nice to see that you so see when things going on to larger things. Yes. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.